This baby is at the start of a long battle, a battle for survival against the elements. It's a struggle we all face, and one for which nature equipped us with two weapons. Our first weapon is this, our skin. It's our prime defense against the elements. It keeps us warm by controlling the amount of heat our bodies release. And it helps us stay dry by keeping the water out. Luckily, we have a brain too, which can help us avoid the conditions our body can't cope with. And now we also have modern clothing, high-tech togs, which are helping us to win that battle against the elements. Here at the Institute of Aviation Medicine, Dr. Andrew Cummins tests the way our bodies react to extreme temperatures and can show how important it is to have the right clothes for the right environment. Our bodies certainly weren't designed to withstand intense cold and they don't float very well either. So we've had to design clothes that will enable us to survive even in the most extreme conditions. In this case, a life jacket which will keep us afloat and an immersion suit which will protect us from the cold, cold water. What I didn't realise was that Andrew also wanted to test how my body would cope with extreme temperatures. So he took me to join another volunteer in his climatic chamber. Now, let me show you in here. This is our climatic wind tunnel. And in here we can warm you up or cool you down just as we like. If necessary, we can turn on a tremendous wind. And here we've fitted to your skin these little thermistors which will give us a readout of the temperature of your skin and we can see how you respond. While Andrew went to monitor our progress from the comfort of his control room, we had to start exercising in the baking hot chamber. I wasn't sure what I'd let myself in for and the other volunteer, David, wasn't giving me any clues. Right, can you hear me, Helen? Yeah. Yep, yep. Good. Now, when you exercise, your muscles consume energy which produces vast amounts of heat and the body has to get rid of this heat somehow. It's carried around in the bloodstream and brought up to the surface of the skin where the heat is lost to your surroundings. You can't actually see that heat unless you use something called Schlieren photography. What you can see are streams of hot air that have been warmed up by the heat from my body. These streams, which are called convection currents, rise up, taking away the heat, and that cools me down. Our bodies work best around 37 degrees Celsius, so we have to get rid of any extra heat we produce or we'd overheat, but convection currents alone aren't enough. So what happens is that the body pours out water onto the surface of the skin in the form of sweat. The heat in the skin heats up the water, which evaporates, and that takes the heat away from your body. Now, let's see what's happening to your skin temperature. Yes, it's falling now to around 33. So the sweat evaporating was cooling me down, and to see how much we were sweating, Andrew made us slip on these really nice plastic jackets. Right, now, I think your jacket's beginning to steam up there, Helen. The back of your jacket's getting quite wet, and this really does show that the sweat is turning into water vapour and leaving the surface of your skin. What's happening is that the sweat is evaporating and then condensing again on the surface of the jacket. He was dead right. The jacket was soaking. Now, what I'm going to do here is turn up the wind speed. I think that'll cool you down a bit and you'll soon start feeling a bit better. It was great. The wind was blowing away the layer of warm air and water vapour and increasing the effect of the sweat. But I was cooling down too fast, so before I got too cold, Andrew stopped the wind. And that's the problem outdoors. If you're cold and damp already, you need some help, or the wind will make matters even worse. If you can't get out of the wind, what you really need is some material that will allow the water vapour to escape. 
but at the same time will protect you from the wind. By the way, this uh, parcel's arrived for you. In the package was a windproof outfit, but I wasn't expecting this. A little overdressed, maybe, but not when Michael Rosen, the fashion consultant who had sent it, turned up with just the right transport. And of course, it would be open top. Hello. Hi. You managed to get the outfit then. God, why am I wearing clothes like this? Well, it's like a long this? story, but I'll try and tell you. Why don't you come in and Thank I'll you. explain it? A lot of people are more out and about than what they used to be. Because of that, lots of new fabrics are being made and developed. And one of them in particular is really what you're wearing. It's called XCR. This, like this, is actually a piece of XCR fabric. Oh, so you see the white put, underneath yeah, the end? Put together here with a piece of chiffon for a petticoat for the skirt. What is it? What exactly is the material? It's a white membrane, which is a little bit like a very thin layer of plastic that can be coated to anything. And it has thousands and thousands of very small holes in it. When you work hard, you can get very hot and sweaty. The heat evaporates the sweat, turns it into moisture, vapour, which can come out through the holes of the XCR fabric, but the wind can't get in. What stops the wind coming in? The tiny perforations, the holes are the right size, that's what's very important. If they were too large, it wouldn't work. In fact, all the clothes that we're looking at today are from the Royal College of Art, from a new generation of designers. And they were briefed to do something with this new fabric. But I wasn't the only one wearing their outfits that day. And after a while, we ended up right in the middle of some sort of fashion shoot. So whether you're digging in the garden or riding a horse or just out walking, it seems that these clothes do work for you and protect you from all the outside elements and the atmosphere. But what it couldn't protect me from was journalists. My dress was about to become headline news. Back at the climatic chamber, I was in for a surprise. Andrew had turned the temperature down and this time it was freezing cold. He also had a camera which could detect skin temperature. He wrote on Andy's back with a block of ice and the change in temperature came up as different colors on the screen. He could even monitor the temperature inside our bodies to see if we could withstand the cold and stay at the crucial 37 degrees Celsius. Right, now the tunnel is now down at around freezing point, so pretty soon your body will begin to feel that it's getting cold. It'll have to conserve the heat somehow. Now remember the blood is what carries the heat around the body and the blood supply to the surface of uh, your body, the skin, will be shut down and it'll have to go through deep inside the body where it's relatively insulated from your surroundings. The temperature on the surface of my skin dropped very quickly by over 10 degrees Celsius but different people react differently, and David's skin was still slightly warmer than mine. But your internal or deep body temperature is holding up really quite well. It's uh, just a little bit above 37. Now, as you get really cold, the body has more and more trouble uh, keeping the heat within it. And it starts to shiver, and that shivering will generate heat in the same way as exercise does. It's really the body's way of making you run on the spot. And now, uh, as you're beginning to shiver, I can see that your deep body temperature is even beginning to rise a little bit as that extra heat from the shivering comes through. It didn't feel like there was any heat coming through. I still felt freezing. Now, the best way of protecting ourselves from the cold is to trap a layer of insulating air around our bodies. The shirts down by your feet should do that. At last, some clothes. And because air is caught inside them, it can't move. So it provides an insulating barrier against the outside. 
Now, Helen, the problem with clothes is that they can get wet. The water replaces that insulating layer of air, and it can also evaporate and take away the heat in that way. Right, well, your skin temperature has stabilised now at around 23 degrees Celsius, which is well below what it would be if you were feeling comfortable, so you should be feeling pretty cold now. <laughs> I thought I was cold before, but this was worse. And then he turned on the wind again. Your skin temperature's gone down to about 17, and your deep body temperature is holding up. Uh, it's well into the 37, a bit, bit more than 37, in fact. This was the last straw. I knew my body was doing its best, but it couldn't keep it up forever. To survive in conditions like this, you need something very high-tech and very, very warm. I decided to escape. And I went to see Neil Gallagher, who has been studying different clothing fibres to see if he can make something better. This is a sample of wool. Um, it has been cleaned and refined. But you can see that if you push it, it springs back. And this means there's a lot of air trapped in between the fibres which give it its thermal insulation properties. If we draw wool out as if we were spinning a yarn, the fibre is very hairy and it can be rather scratchy against the skin. Here we have a bundle of fibres under a high-powered microscope and we can see the gaps in between the fibres which trap the air and give wool its insulation properties. We can also start to see the surface of the wool, which has got a scaly appearance. If wool is wet and is beaten mechanically, as in a washing machine, for instance, the scales ride up over one another, rather like a ratchet, and the wool shrinks. So the aim is to make a new, smooth and shrinkable fibre with big gaps to trap lots of air. These lengths of pasta are similar to the fibres that clothes are made from, although the pasta is much bigger. And the secret is in the way they bundle together. For instance, this spaghetti is rather like the wool we have just seen. And these, if we made fibres in this shape, pack together to give some rather large holes in between them. And if we make a flat end shape like this, the fibres sit together differently again. And making these fibres is a bit, in a way, like making pasta. And making pasta is simple. You take your ingredients, mix them together and force them through a nozzle into a variety of different shapes. But when you make fibres, the recipe is slightly different. We start with trees and take the wood from them and clean it and refine it until it's in this form. Add several chemicals and turn it into this solution, this goes, which we pour into our pot and take that to the spinning machine. And then, as we did when we made pasta, we take a nozzle, which we call a spinneret, which is very much smaller. And then they're forced out into these thin fibres. Just like making pasta. Once the fibres had been separated and cleaned, it was back under the microscope. And they looked very different from the wool fibres we'd seen earlier. Here we see a Y-shaped fibre. And we can see that the fibres pack together in a way which leave large gaps in between each fibre, which traps air and helps the fibre insulate. We can also see grooves on the surface of the fibre, which help move moisture away from the wearer the fibre is also much smoother than wool, it doesn't have that hairiness, and we hope that it will be a much more comfortable fibre to wear against the skin. Well, that was fine, but I also needed protection from the rain. Way up in the clouds, Karen Levy had some answers. This one here, Helen, is called Gore-Tex, and um, it's a fantastic membrane because it has t hundreds and thousands of tiny little holes in it, and those holes allow water vapour to come out but keep the water in. 
And if I turn this upside down, water stays in the glass and um, fabric is perfectly dry on the outside. The uh, water droplets here are too big to actually get through this membrane. But hot sweat or water vapour is small enough to escape through the tiny holes in this fabric. Now, if we actually look at a garment like this, for example, we can see that the membrane has been sandwiched between a very fashionable mulberry red mac and the cotton inner lining. So this is also a very functional garment in that it will keep you perfectly dry when you're out there fending off the British weather. Well, theory is one thing, but someone has to test it and guess who got the job. And the result? Not bad. But keeping dry and warm aren't the only things. Clothing also has to be comfy. But that's difficult because of the way our skin moves and stretches across our bodies. The problem is that many clothes will restrict our movement because they don't naturally stretch like our skin, which is something Pierre Paolo Mussoni has been looking at. And I'll measure here the stretch of a knee. I'm taking here 30 centimeters when the knee is straight. And I'll measure those 30 centimeters again when the knee is bent. They become 42. And this happens all over our body, as I say. It's very important when performing sports or outdoor activities to have uh, garments which behave in the same way. Fabrics which stretch very much like our skin does. So they invented lycra stretchy elastic fibres woven into nylon sports clothes to make them bend or stretch, like our skin. It doesn't only stretch, but it recovers. That is, it always goes back to its initial shape. And now they can do the same with any fibre by wrapping it around and around lycra. It's like this cable. Natural fibres only stretch like this if they're coiled. Lycra inside makes them recover. Just imagine this is, for example, a wool thread. And we found a way of putting lycra inside it. So it feels like wool, looks like wool, but it stretches like lycra. Which means you can make stretchy dresses, stretchy ball gowns, and even stretchy dinner suits. And because the lycra pulls them back into shape, they don't go baggy. It wasn't always this easy, though. Carolyn Fay, who used to dance for the Bally Ram Bear, can remember what old-fashioned costumes were like. When I started dancing, we wore costumes like this, which were boned, and the bones used to break. Also, they were made of very, very stiff tarlatan with a tulle over the top, but the underneath was very, very scratchy. The costumes weren't washed. They just went on until they fell to pieces and were very, very smelly. Then along came lycra. It meant that you could have beautiful fitting body tights and um, it made it possible for dancers to writhe all over the floor and stand up and still look immaculate, excepting they probably had dirty knees because it would be in white. <laughs> So I discovered high-tech togs to keep off the wind, keep out the rain, and keep in the warmth. I found out how to mix fibres to make clothes stretchy and comfy to wear. But even this range of clothes couldn't deal with everything. Thank you. And another thing we have to protect our bodies from is impact. Normally we absorb impact through our muscles and in pads of cartilage in our joints but our bodies were never designed to cope with the pounding we get from today's hard environment. So even for simple activities like running, 
What we wear on our feet must protect us from the impact of every single step. And now, some shoes are built with little pads of this in the soles. It's a high-tech gel that's so good at absorbing impact, it's claimed it can even stop a falling egg from breaking. Bad egg, and this one's not boiled. And so to Scotland to find out how all these different materials can be combined into clothes that will protect us from far more dangerous impacts. To survive something like that, you need something like these. Multi-layered clothes that perform a number of different tasks all at once. To find out about all the different layers, I spoke to the company's managing director, Jim Hunter. We use three layers, one to protect from the inclement weather conditions or outside elements. The second protects from soft skin tissue injury. The third layer here, we have a specialized foam which is very high energy absorbance and recovers very quickly on impact with the road. And this helps to prevent bone fracture. We then, of course, have a lining falling on to bond the, th the three layers together. And this is what it looks like after a test crash. The outer layer is designed to melt and stick to the road, which slows down the rider. But it's not just impacts that these clothes deal with. The secret is to combine materials into different clothes that do different jobs, whether it be protecting foresters from chainsaws or firefighters from burning buildings. And lastly, there was a suit for me. This is the ultimate suit designed to deal with the harshest environment of all, space. <laughs> 